Let's take a look at position, velocity, and acceleration today. This is section 2-2, day 3. The derivative can be used for many things, and one of them is to fly, find the slope of the tangent line. But that also determines the rate of change of one variable with respect to another. So what we've been working on is like a dy dx, or sometimes we've called it f prime of x, or sometimes we've even called that y prime. What we're doing is we're finding the rate of change of y with respect to x. The rate of change of y with respect to the rate of change of x. And we've made x a very, very, very small change, getting it down as the limit of delta x goes to 0. So we can also use this to um, discuss velocity and acceleration. The function that gives the position where it's at relative to the origin of an object is a function of time and it's called the position function. It tells us where things are at at a particular time. The position function, you will often see it notated as s of t or x of t, where t is our variable and t of course is standing for time. Now that might be minutes, seconds, or hours, whatever, some, some unit of time. In physics, I think often you'll see it as x of t, so be familiar with that. Our book will probably use s of t most of the time. And this gives the position or the relative position to the origin of an object as a function of time. Rates of change in our study of calculus, we're often interested in when an object or particle is speeding up, slowing down, when it's stopped, not moving, or when it has no acceleration. Um, we can also be wondering, is it moving left? Is it moving right? Is it moving up? Is it moving down? And all of these items we can get off of derivatives. If you recall, there's a notation, and I'm not sure we've hit this yet, but the average rate of change, you could call it a rock, of a function y equals f of x over an interval, and then we can specify where we're starting our x value and where we're ending our x value. The average rate of change, we know that delta y stands for a change of y, which we could see as like f of x1 minus f of x0, are two different x values, which formally you've always seen as y1 or y2 minus y1, um, where maybe I'll even go 2 and 1 here. So f of x2 minus f of x1, and then that'll match up with y2 minus y1. And a change in x, we could think of it as x2 minus x1. Remember, the average rate of change really is nothing more than the slope of the secant line. We have two points. Let's just think about this. We have two points out here, our x1, y1 point, and our y2, x, or x2, y2 point. And if I connect them up, I'm going to calculate out the difference of the y's and the difference of the x's and get our rate of change. Average velocity of an object over time. Good to keep in mind, it's really just a rate. It's the change of distance over the change of time. And that is average velocity. A lot of people have trouble recalling how to calculate average velocity. It's really just your change of distance over your change of time. The average velocity between T1 and T2 is the slope of the secant line. And the instantaneous, take note of these two because they are different, average velocity and instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous velocity is at a point. So maybe I chose my point in time to be T1. Well, then I'm looking for the slope of its tangent line. And we've talked about tangent lines when we talk about derivatives. So look at this diagram and hopefully you can pick up the difference. A secant line, here's the, the object's path. But if I find its velocity, its change of y over its change of x, I'm really getting an average change between those two points versus the derivative will give us the slope of the tangent line. 
and there we're just working with a precise point, a point in time perhaps. So instantaneous velocity tells us how fast something is going at an exact moment, at an exact instance, and in which direction it's traveling. So that's kind of handy. That is, how is the position changing with respect to time? And this can all be really, um, represented by this um, equation here, ds dt, the change of position over the change of time. So if you want to write that change of position or the change of distance over the change of time. S prime of t, another way of writing it, also related to what we call velocity. So S prime of t and velocity are one and the same. And then here is the limit definition of a derivative of how to calculate out that. But we know the shortcuts, so that is the approach we'll take. Speed now, speed's just a little bit different than velocity. Speed tells us just how fast an object is going, and it doesn't give us any information about direction. Speed measures the rate at which the position changes. And notice here, here's the relationship between speed and velocity. Speed is the absolute value of velocity. So when I do velocity and I take my derivative, I can get positive velocity or I can get negative velocity. Positive velocity means that an object is either traveling upward or it's moving to the right. So we either have right movement or upward movement. A negative velocity means that my object is traveling downward or perhaps it is moving left. So it's good to keep that in, in mind. And that would be the sign of our velocity. When I come into speed, I strip off the positive and negative because I'm taking the absolute value of velocity. So it's really just going to give us an indication of how fast it's moving. Now, acceleration. How do I get to acceleration? Well, it's an instantaneous rate of change of velocity. So you could think of it as the change of the change. It tells how quickly the body speeds up or slows down, how fast the object is changing with respect to time. So um, S double prime is how I get to acceleration. So this is acceleration, and I'm going to take a second derivative off of, so I'm taking a derivative of the velocity function, and that's indicated right here. This is the notation um, that Leibniz used d squared s over dt squared. So take note of how that is written. We can explain that in class a little bit. Um, this is dv dt, the change of velocity over the change of time, and this all represents acceleration, which we can notate as a of t. So learning these um, relationships is very key. Techniques for speeding up and slowing down. If I want to talk about an object speeding up or slowing down, I need to look at two components. I need to look at velocity in conjunction with the acceleration of the object. If they have the same sign, perhaps they're both positive, I know my object is speeding up. So either they're both positive and it's speeding up, or it could be the case that they're both negative meaning velocity is negative and acceleration is negative. That will cause an object to speed up. Velocity and acceleration, if they have opposite signs, perhaps velocity is positive and acceleration is negative, my object is going to slow down. And you can see in the chart below some information on that. So positive velocity and positive acceleration means we are speeding up. Negative velocity and negative acceleration means it is also speeding up. So just a lot of um, ground rules kind of to work with acceleration and velocity. So let's do some problems. It's probably time to do that, huh? Um, you know what? I'm going to just shrink this and bring this over. So an object is launched. Oh, a projectile is launched vertically upward from the ground level with an initial velocity of 114 feet per second. So I got this guy getting shot out of a cannon, and uh, well, let's follow his path. So find the velocity and the speed at time 3 and at time 5. 
Okay, so sometimes you have to generate your own position function off of the given information. To do that, I need to know some basics. So I can give an, a position function here, s of t, and s of t is 1 half g t squared plus v naught of t, or times t, plus s naught. What do all those stand for? Well, g is our gravitational force. And that can be written two words, or two ways. Negative 32 feet per second for English units. Negative because it is a downward force. And another alternate way is 9.8 meters per second. And this is the effects of gravity that we feel. T, of course, stands for time. V naught is our initial velocity. And S naught is our initial position. S of t is going to be my final position at time t. So those are handy to know. And in this particular case, we need to write our own. It was not given to us. Often they will give us the position function. But I think we're going to be able to, to do it quite easily here. So I'm going to erase my stuff here and uh, construct the position function. So S of t is equal to 1 half. Now, do I use negative 32 or negative 9.8? I look back up here and see the units, and I see feet, and I see seconds, which means that we're working in um, English units, so 32 feet per second. Um, time, you know what, I'm going to put my labels in here. I was debating about it, but let's do it. Feet per second. It'll make the science people happy, right? And then time squared don't know what my time is yet, plus my initial velocity. Here they just told us the initial velocity, so I know v naught up here is 114. So I'm going to get initial velocity of 114 feet per second multiplied by time plus our initial position. And how do I get initial position? Well, it says the projectile was launched vertically upward from ground level, and that is a key right there, that our initial position was zero. So I'd have plus zero out here. And let's just simplify this a little bit. I'd have half of 32, that gives me negative 16 t squared, plus 114 t, and then plus zero. Now, it's asking us, um, find the velocity and the speed at time 3 and time 5. I want to get to velocity. So to get to velocity, I take a derivative. I want to know the change of position with respect to time. Velocity, take a derivative. And we know our shortcut rules, so this will be fairly quick work. S prime of t, which really represents v of t, velocity is equal to the 2 comes down multiplies by the negative 16 gives us negative 32 t plus this has a power of 1 on that variable t so 1 times 14 or 114 gives me 114 this is our velocity function now all i need to do to find the velocity at time t velocity at time equals 3 is plug in 3. So I'm going to evaluate my derivative at 3, which will give me the velocity at 3. And throw in our 3. It looks like what negative 96 plus 114 will equal 18. And it turns out to be feet per second. Change of position over change of time.
Do likewise as prime of 5 will give us our velocity at 5. And that means we'll calculate at 5, add on the 114. And I think you'll find out that this has negative 46 feet per second. It also asks what is the speed at those time frames. Well, the speed will be the absolute value. Speed, recall, is equal to the absolute value of velocity. Okay, that's pretty easy then, isn't it? So if we want the speed of the object, speed at time 3, I'm going to take V of 3 and absolute value it. So let's look at the absolute value of 18. Uh, it stays 18. 18 feet per second. Speed at time 5. Absolute value of velocity at time 5. And absolute value of negative 46 then is 46 feet per second. I believe there's a part B. I know I've probably taken up all your space just on part A. The next question says, how high will the projectile rise? So I did this. Here's our, our body getting shot out of the cannon. It's going to reach maximum height here at the vertex of the parabola, right? And I know what's happening at that top peak. Think about it. This particular time frame, there's some time here, that the tangent line has what slope? Here's my tangent line. Well, its slope would be 0, correct? So what I'm going to do is take the velocity function, because velocity also is going to 0 out when it reaches the top. So I'm going to take my velocity and set it equal. Velocity reaches 0 at the height of that parabola. So take our velocity function and set it equal to 0, and we can figure out time. Velocity equal to 0 to find the time that we reached that. So our velocity function was negative 32t plus 114. Set it equal to 0. Calculating this out, you'll find that time is equal to, I got, um, well, I shouldn't, I'm going to write the fraction first, 114 um, divided by 32, which is approximately 3.5625. So it took them about three and a half seconds to reach the height of the uh, traveling path. Now, how high did that get? Well, now I'm going to switch over. I know how long it took. Let's switch over to position function, which gives us the position of the object. So the position function is going to help us figure out where it's at. And that is the S of T function. S of T equals, we had negative 16T squared plus 114T. That's what we started with when we started this whole problem. Well, we just need to evaluate this then at the time frame that this happened. I'm going to go back to my 114 divided by 32 and calculate it off that. Because I need three decimal places of accuracy for AP Calc. And this will help ensure that I get as accurate of answer as possible when I use um, when I use the fraction rather than the rounded decimal approximation. So doing that, I came up with an answer of the position being about, let's do an about here, 203.0625, and that would be in feet. So we reached a height of about 203 feet. And finally, this is, I think we'll do this and then I'll finish the rest of them in class. Find the speed of the object when it hits the ground. Well, we have our body being launched, and at some point it comes back down to a zero mark, right? It starts at a height of zero and it finishes at a height of zero. So 
All I need to do is take my position function. I know the position finishes with s of t equaling 0. Take your um, position function, set it equal to 0. Our position function was negative 16t squared plus 114t equals 0. I'm going to pull out a negative 2t, the common, um, what is that called? The, G the GCF. Let's take out the GCF. And I get two answers, right? I'm picking up that time could have been 0 because this is like a factor. And if it zeroes out, the answer will be 0. And then I pick up my other answer here by setting this equal to 0. And that appears like it's going to be 57 eighths. So at 57 eighths second, um, the object hits the ground. But that doesn't give us the speed, does it? That just gives us the time at which it hits the ground. And in order to get the speed of the object, speed, isn't this fun, guys? Speed is equal to the absolute value of velocity. So I need to get the velocity of the function at, at times t. So speed at time equals to 57 eighths is what I'm really after. So go to your velocity function, which was really the first derivative of the position function, and that was negative 32t plus 114, and evaluate the velocity at 57 eighths. You know, the main thing on these, you really just have to really read the question of what they're asking, and you're going to use one of three functions. You're either going to use position function, S of T, velocity function, or the acceleration function, all of which are those two are just derivatives off of the position function. Um, and then you can get your answer on here, which I believe is um, negative 114. And that shows us the downward movement, doesn't it? That it was the object was traveling downward, which is making sense to me. Um, so this is our velocity at 57 eighths. But I want speed. So since I want speed, I'm going to absolute value this. Let's put tack a speed in front of here. Speed is equal to a positive 114 feet per second. I knew this would be a long one. Um, we will work on the other two examples in class and then do some homework. So see you in class on Monday.